in front of somebody, and somebody will read it for us, and we'll see what it says. It is Colossians 1.29. It's right there in your lesson, or read it out of the Bible. Either way. What's Paul's opinion? Okay, Dan, you're going to be the first reader. Colossians 1.29, what does it say? To this end I strenuously contend, struggling with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. To this end I do what? Strenuously contend. Strenuously contend. Does that sound easy to you? Not in any way, shape, or form. Did you read Monday's lesson? It says in Colossians 1.29, there's a very interesting insight into the way Paul he sees his relationship with God in this work. He says that he is struggling, but with the power of God. The Greek word translated labor means to grow weary or to work to the point of exhaustion. Does that sound easy? This word was used particularly of athletes as they trained. The word for struggle, which comes next, can mean in some languages to agonize. So we have the word picture of an athlete straining with everything to win. And then Paul adds a twist to the idea because Paul is straining not with everything he has, but with everything that God gives him. Hallelujah, but it's still a struggle. It is a tough struggle. trying to think of what they call those games they have nowadays every four years. Olympic Games. Thank you. I knew somebody would remember it. Thank you, Rita. The Olympic Games. When did they start? Where did they start? Before the time of Paul. Where? In Greece. And so Paul refers in his writings from time to time to the Olympic Games because he knew what they were like. And we think that athletes today struggle. Not like they did back then. There were times when people would die in their struggle to train for these athletic games. They were dead serious about them and they were not easy. There was nothing easy about them. They worked to the point of exhaustion. They agonized. Remember what Paul wrote in Romans 7? Well, we'll turn to it and that way we'll remember it and somebody will read for us. Read, uh, whoever is going to be our reader, read Romans 7, start with verse 21, as Paul gives his own personal experience. Now, we can argue with a lot of things, we can argue with people's beliefs, but you can't, exper you can't argue with a person's experience. They've experienced it, you didn't. All right, here's... Paul's experience, Romans 7, starting in verse 21. Go ahead, please. I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. Now, wait a minute. Who's speaking here? Paul. When he wants to do what's right, what does he find himself doing? Doing wrong. What's wrong? Okay, keep reading. I love God's law with all my heart. But there is another power within me that is at war within my mind. This power makes me a slave to sin mm. that is still within me. Keep going. On what a miserable person I am. Mm. 
Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin? Okay, hang on a minute. Let's look at that. Let's look at some of the things you've already read. I'm going to have you read a little more too, but I want to look at some of the things that you've already read. Romans 7. There it is. I don't do the good I want. Instead, the evil that I don't want is what I do. Who's speaking? Whoa. I find it to be a rule, a kind of perverse one, that although I want to do what is good, evil is right there with me. Wow. And then what did he say in verse 24? What a miserable creature I am. Again, this is Paul talking. What a miserable creature I am. And then he asks the rhetorical question, who will rescue me from this body bound for death? He is so miserable he sees himself bound for death. And then he answers his question in the very next verse. So read that for us, please. Verse 25. Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. There it is right there. He is so distressed. He says, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God. Through Jesus Christ, my Lord, I'll be rescued. Is the Christian life easy? No, it is not. Why not? Because we're sinful human beings. Well, we live in a fallen world. And we sure do. And when a Christian turns his life over to Jesus Christ fully in purity, it's going to be a struggle in this world. And it is. And it is. Ted, go ahead. When Kay and I accepted Christ, a lot of our friends fell away. Yeah. Just as Paul, when he accepted Christ, all of his associates turned against him. And Jesus himself had that experience when they went to Caesarea Philippi and Peter made that wonderful statement about who Jesus was. But after that, it says that crowds of people left him, no longer followed him. Finally, Jesus says to the disciples, are you going to leave too? He was so concerned with how many people had left that he wondered if they would leave too. So he says, are you going to leave too? Yeah, he felt it. Brother Ron. Why doesn't the all-powerful God give us seemingly more power to deal with these problems if we lived on a level playing field yes and God does give us the strength and Paul makes that clear in Colossians and here that in Jesus Christ we can be conquerors but it's never going to be easy it's a battle it's a Olympic Games we're training for and there's nothing easy about that. Praise the Lord, God is on our side and he's more powerful than Satan and ultimately he'll win. Does that mean every single day? No, but ultimately he'll win. To make that extremely, extremely, extremely simple. Okay, go for it. I think most people already know this. When a child's born, he doesn't know how to walk. A child takes numerous falls before he learns how to walk. I have heard that if a child does not take those falls, he does not walk properly when he does walk. Okay. So the illustration is of a child learning to walk. Do they ever fall as they're learning to walk? <laughs> Every step they take almost is a fall. You watch a child learning to walk. It's incredible the way they do it. I think about Ella and when she learned to walk. I didn't think she was ever going to walk. She 
would get a hold of something like this. She wanted to go over there. And then she'd get down on the floor and she'd crawl over to it. She just didn't quite have the courage to take a few more steps over to where she wanted to go. So, of course, what did we do? We stayed a few feet away from her and said, come on. Did it work? No. Down on the floor and crawled over and then stood up. <laughs> That's a necessary part of learning to walk. None of you remember that because that happened when you were infants. But if you've had children, you remember what it was like for them. My son never crawled. He was a hitcher. That's what they call him. Looked like he was swimming. Bodies flat out behind him. And he was fast. I remember one time we were in church somewhere. And he got loose from me. Swam up that middle aisle right up to the microphone, which is what he was after. And he was so fast, I couldn't catch him before he got there. After he learned to walk, then he learned to crawl. <laughs> but never before. He was a hitcher. Yeah, the Christian life is not easy. Are there falls in it? Yes, there are. And we're going to get into that a little bit more when we get over to Wednesday's lesson. But yes, there are times when we struggle, and it's not going to be the same thing for everybody. Some people are going to struggle with one thing, some people are going to struggle with another thing, but the Christian life is a struggle. It was for Paul, and it is for us. Look at Tuesday's lesson. In the middle of the page there, there were some blank lines and some questions, so I know you wrote down your answers, because whenever there's blank lines and a question there, you know you got to write an answer down. All right, so here we go. What examples can you find from the Bible where people made choices based on feelings rather than on God's Word? Let's go back a little bit. Tuesday's lesson, back a little bit. It says, one of the greatest enemies of our wills is our own feelings. Ooh. We are increasingly living in a culture bombarded with pictures and music that, a, that can appeal directly to our senses, triggering our emotions, anger, fear, lust, whatever, without our realizing it. How often do we think such things as, what do I feel like eating for supper? What do I feel like doing today? Do I feel good about buying this? And as I'm reading these things, I'm thinking of various television advertisements. Remember that one from years ago? Was it L'Oreal hair color? L'Oreal. It costs more, but you're worth it. It's still on? Oh, horrors. That was terrible. 20 years ago when it first came out, it's still bad. How about the one, you only go around once in life, so... These things stay in my mind because I've heard them, heard them 20 years ago or more, maybe 30 years ago. What are they appealing to? Are they appealing to my relationship with God? Not hardly. Yeah. Doesn't a lot depend on what you spend time with? Absolutely. If you spend most of your time in our culture, then you're going to be like a tree that turns towards the sun, you're going to be bent towards our culture. Yep. If you spend more time in your Bible, fellow associates of Christians, I mean, it, 
it becomes easier to resist. You can identify it. I mean, who was it? Uh, tempted by Potiphar's wife? Yeah, didn't Joseph. Have, yeah, didn't have a problem with resisting that. No, he was ready for it because he had a relationship with the Lord. Exactly. So whatever you spend your time with, that is going to mold you. It is. You're right. But this whole idea of feelings, it says here after the, what I just read, feelings have thus become intimately involved in our decision making. So are we using this or are we using feelings? Feelings are not necessarily bad, but how I feel about something may have little to do with what is right or best. Indeed, our feelings can lie to us. The heart is deceitful above all things and can create a false picture of reality, causing us to make bad choices, setting us up for a crucible that we don't need. And then it asked, what examples can you find from the Bible where people made choices based on feelings rather than on God's word? We're not going to read these verses because we know what they're talking about. So somebody tell me, what happened in Genesis 3-6? You don't even need to open your Bibles. You know what happened in Genesis 3-6. Tell me what happened there. More specifically. Eve saw. Eve saw the fruit. Saw that it was good to make one wise. That it looked like good fruit. And so she took it to, and ate it. And because Eve ate the apple, we're all in a world of sin today. She felt good about that apple, or whatever kind of fruit it is, doesn't matter. All right, what happened in 2 Samuel 11? Again, you know the story, you don't even need to look at it. We know what happened. What happened in 2 Samuel 11? David, what about David? Did you read it again? What was it that drew him to Bathsheba? It said, what was she doing when he first saw her? Taking a bath. Do any of you ever take a bath? In public? <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> but obviously she was. How did, how did he see her? She lived in Jerusalem in a hot climate obviously she was bathing outside what do you wear when you take a bath hello hello what do you wear nothing, nothing. so what's she wearing so what does he what appeals to him in this whole thing she, a naked woman is taking a bath and he's enjoying the show To be fair to Bathsheba, she's taking a bath on her roof, and normally you can't see somebody's roof. He could only see her roof because his house is above everybody else's house. But, you know, he should be more responsible since he's the king and learn to look away. Because so, he, he, instead, he looks? He looks and he says, oh, I like that one. Can I have her, please? Find out who she is, finds out her name, finds out her husband's name, finds out the family name, finds out everything. And then the very next words are, he sent for her. Which, when you think about it, he found out her husband's name, right? So he had all the facts. He wasn't confused about who she was. Nope. But his feelings were more important than any facts. And that's that what we're heard. dealing with right now. His feelings can override your better judgment. And they did in this case. What happened as a result of that? Well, to put it bluntly, David's reputation was destroyed. The child that was born as a result of that died, and that was terrible. And yet we see God's mercy too, because another child was born to David and Bathsheba, and his name was King Solomon. David. By the way, when this is going on, is he already married? Oh, yeah. And we know what happens to Uriah. I remember hearing a preacher say a number of years ago, when we get to heaven, 
there's going to have to be some explaining going on. If Uriah's there, and David's there, and Bathsheba's there, somebody's got to make an explanation. When you think of King David, do you think of his younger years when he went up against Goliath? You might. When, do you think of that statement that God made, he's a man after my own heart? Maybe you think of that. Or is the first thing you think of Bathsheba? That's why I say he ruined his own reputation. We tend to associate him with that. Which was a horrible thing and caused a great deal of problems for his own family. But we still have the story today. Rita. We have one comment. She says, David wasn't supposed to be there in the first place. He was supposed to have gone to war with the with army. Men. Yes, exactly. Because that chapter begins with the words, at the time of the year when soldiers went out to fight. Well, David should have been leading them. But he stays back in the palace. So he shouldn't have been there. You're right. None of this should have happened. But it did. Why did it? Because his feelings ran away from his sense of what was right and wrong. Sad thing. Let's go on to Wednesdays. <laughs> oh boy. I need somebody to read two verses. They only list one here, but I want two read. So somebody read Matthew 5, 29 and 30. Ted's looking around anxiously, seeing who's volunteering to do the reading. Thank you for volunteering, Nancy. <laughs> Matthew 5, 29 and 30. All right. Okay. Matthew 5, 29 and 30. But I tell you that anyone who has looked at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Okay, 29 and 30. That was 28, and that's fine. So sorry. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one eye than, uh, or part of your body than for one whole, for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right eye and right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask another question, and I'm going to ask you to be honest. I, I probably shouldn't bother doing that, because anyways, I'll ask you to be honest, and let's see if anybody is. Have your eyes ever caused you to sin? Raise your hand if they have. Well, we have a few honest people. All right, let's ask the other one. Has your hand ever caused you to sin? If it has, raise it. That's the key word. <laughs> now, let's go back to the eyes. Maybe you saw something that you shouldn't have seen, kind of like David did. Which eye did you see it with? Did you have one of them closed and the other one open? <laughs> Probably not. 
So if you're going to gouge out the offending eye, which one are you going to gouge out? All right. Let's suppose I sin with my hand. This is a little easier one to do. Let's suppose I sin with my hand. I punch somebody in the nose. Would Christ want me to punch somebody in the nose? Probably not. But I'm still angry, so I punch somebody in the nose. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. So I take a hatchet and wham, off comes my hand. But somebody else makes me mad, so I punch them with my left. How am I going to cut it off? I don't have a right hand to use with the axe anymore. You can kick them. So, so think about what we're reading here. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out, throw it away, throw it in the trash. Or your hand, cut it off. Mm. I think about what we read about last week in Genesis 22. Abraham and Isaac on Mount Moriah. And I said, how did Abraham know that was God speaking to him? To sacrifice his son. And of course the answer is, he had heard God's voice all his life, many times. So he knew the voice of God. Did God want Abraham to kill his son? No, of course not. So why did he ask him to do it? It was a test. And, and that chapter makes it very plain. It was a test. God stopped him before the end. He was just testing to see whether Abraham really trusted God that much. And then I made the statement that I always make when I talk about Genesis 22. And that is this. If God ever tells you to sacrifice your child, that's not the voice of God. That's coming from a very different place being, if you ever hear that. And I do that because I've thought through the years, I've preached on Genesis 22, so many different churches, so many times. I've thought I'd hate for anybody, I'd hate to even hear about anybody hearing Genesis 22 and then killing their child because they felt God, no, no, no. God's not going to ever tell you to destroy your child. That is not God's voice if you hear that. It is not God's voice. It was that time only. Never in anybody else's. Now, let's go back to what we're looking at. With that in mind, have our eyes ever caused us to sin? Most of us said yes, they had at least one of them. Have our hands ever caused us to sin? And many of us again said yes. Does God really want us to maim ourselves because of that? And I've already heard no's and I head, see heads shaking. No, he doesn't. He does not. So why does Jesus put this in the Bible? If your right eye makes you sin, gouge it out and throw it away. Better that you should lose one part of you than have your whole body thrown into Gehinnom. And if your right hand makes you sin, cut it off and throw it away. Better that you should lose one part of you than have your whole body thrown into Gehinnom. What is he trying to tell us here if he does not literally mean we're supposed to maim ourselves because we've sinned in some way. What's the point? What is Jesus trying to tell us? He's trying to tell us the seriousness of sin. That's his point. 
it's serious to sin. And he doesn't want us to sin. And I've asked this question, told this so many times, including in this room, so I know you know the answer. What's wrong with sin? Why does God not want us to sin? What's wrong with sin? Well, those are, those are peripheral, but we got to hit it head on. What's wrong with sin? It hurts the sinner. And God is not selfish. Some people say sin hurts God. Well, maybe in a sense it does. But the reason God wants us to stop sinning is he knows sin always hurts the sinner. And God wants us to stop hurting ourselves. God loves us so much that he doesn't want us to sin because he doesn't want us to suffer. And that's what he's saying here. This is how serious sin is. In a sense, you'd be better off to pluck that sinful part and throw it away. Don't do it literally. But sin is literal. And he doesn't want us to do it because he knows it hurts us. And he doesn't want us to keep hurting ourselves. Okay, Thursday's lesson. Let's go to Genesis 32. We know this story. We've known all the stories that we've looked at today. But whenever I say that, I think of the time that I said that in a sermon in Pierce, South Dakota. <laughs> and after the sermon... This certain lady came up to me and she said, we don't know the stories as well as you do because I kept saying, you all know this story. And so, and she came up and said, we don't know these stories. So tell us the story. All right, so let's read the story. Look at Genesis 32. And let's see what happens here. Genesis 32. What do you want read? The whole chapter. And you are illustrating the point of this chapter, <laughs> Ted, because I see Odell as being a little bit hesitant, and you're being persistent. <laughs> And that's what we're going to talk about here. Okay. We'll, we'll let you off this once. <laughs> All right, read it. Genesis 32. And before you read it, let's talk just for a moment about what this is supposed to be illustrating. Perseverance. Persevere. Before she reads it, what do the words perseverance or persevere mean? Pardon? Overcoming. Overcoming. Keep on keeping on. Keep on keeping on. Again, if we think back to the Olympic Games, especially the ancient Olympic Games, and the extreme degree that they went to to prepare for them, did they persevere? <laughs> you bet they did. Perseverance. Perseverance is keeping going when you want to quit. All right, let's read the story. Go ahead, read it. Jacob also went on his way, and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, This is the camp of God. So he named that place Mahanaim. Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He instructed them, this is what you are to say to my master Esau. Your servant Jacob says, I have been staying with Laban and have remained there till now. I have cattle and donkeys, sheep and goats, manservants and maidservants. 
Now I am sending this message to my Lord that I may find favor in your eyes. And just to make sure we understand, 20 years before, Jacob had deceived his father Isaac. And in that way, Jacob gave the birth, got the birthright that was supposed to be Esau's because Esau is the firstborn. They were twins, so born a few minutes apart, but Esau was older. He should have gotten the birthright. He traded it for a bowl of lentils. Now, I happen to love lentils, but probably not enough to trade away a birthright. But anyways, and Esau was so angry when he learned what Jacob had done that he said, I'm going to kill him. And Jacob took it seriously. And so did Jacob's mother, who said to him, go to Laban, my brother, and stay there for a little while until your brother's anger passes. And then come back. And then she said those famous words, why should I be deprived of both of you in one day? Jacob went to Laban's house, stayed there 20 years, and during that time his mother died. He never got to see her again. So she was deprived of Jacob despite her wishes. So last Jacob has heard from Esau, Esau wants to kill him. Notice the wording that Esau, that Rita read. This is what you are to say to my master, Esau. Your servant, Jacob, says, I've been with Laban all this time, blah, blah, and I'm coming back now. Now I am sending this message to my Lord that I may find favor in your eyes. Quite a reversal. Wow. Keep reading, please. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, We went to your brother Esau, and now he's coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. In great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups, and the flocks and herds and camels as well. He thought, if Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left may escape. Mm. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two groups. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me, and also the mothers with their children. But you have said I will surely make you prosper, and will make your descendants like the land of the sea which cannot be counted. He spent the night there, and from what he had with him, he selected a gift for his brother Esau. Listen to the gift. Read is about to read it. Go ahead. 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 female camels with their young, 40 cows and 10 bulls, and 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. Is that a gift? <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Wow. Okay, keep reading, please. He put them in the care of his servants, each herd by itself, and said to his servants, Go ahead of me and keep some space between the herds. He instructed the one in the lead, When my brother Esau meets you and asks, To whom do you belong and where are you going, and who owns all these animals in front of you, then you are to say, They belong to your servant Jacob. They are a gift sent to my Lord Esau, and he is coming behind us. Notice again, your servant Jacob, my Lord Esau. Keep reading, please. He also instructed the second, the third, and all the others who followed the herds. You are to say the same thing to Esau when you meet him. And be sure to say your servant Jacob is coming behind us. For he thought, I will pacify him with these gifts I am sending on ahead. Later, when I see him, perhaps he will receive me. So Jacob's gifts went on ahead of him, but he put 
he, but he himself spent the night in the camp. And while he's spending the night in the camp, he's not sleeping. What's he thinking about? Esau. Yeah, facing Esau. Tomorrow, I'm going to meet Brother Esau. Last time we were together, he was going to kill me. These are the thoughts going through Jacob's mind that night. He can't sleep. Look at the next words. Go ahead. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his eleven sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Okay, the hold man up right there. All right, so it starts by saying, so Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. Who was that man? Who did he think it was? Esau, or one of Esau's men. But who was it really? It was the Lord Jesus himself wrestling with Jacob. But Jacob thinks this is either Esau or one of Esau's men. And notice when the man, that is Jesus, saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip. Whoa! Jacob held his own in this wrestling match. They were pretty evenly matched until there was a touch and suddenly his hip is out of socket. Have you ever had a dislocated anything? A lot of fun, isn't it? What's the first thing you think of? It hurts. It hurts. Go ahead, Ted. Lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I've been there once in a while. <laughs> I know what it's like. It'll come back to you. Okay, so he touches his hip. It's out of joint. Go ahead. Read on, please. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. Interesting. It's daybreak, and that's the key that I must leave. All right. Look what goes now. Look what he says. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. So the man, which we know is Jesus, makes it sound as if he doesn't even know who he's wrestling with. Did he know who he's wrestling with? Of course he did. So why is he asking his name? He already knows it. But this happens frequently in the Bible, where God asks a person his name, even though God knows full well what the name is. But he's about to make an important point. What is your name? Look at the answer. Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you, are struck, you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. And that's so amazing. What is your name, Jacob? What did the name Jacob mean? Supplanter. Because he had taken his brother's birthright. He was the supplanter. What does the name Israel mean? People of God. Struggles with God, literally, is what Israel means. Struggles with God. Had he struggled with God? You better believe he had that night. In that wrestling match, he had. So he, be, he was the supplanter. He became one who struggles with God. And somewhere... About the time that that man touched his hip, it dawned on Jacob or Israel who he had been wrestling with. Up till then, he thought it was somebody else. Now it's clear. Go ahead, Ted. You thought of it. <laughs> I found that's interesting. 
when they came to arrest Jesus, there was a flash and everybody fell back. And yet this one man, Jacob, still same person. Yep. Fighting with them all night. Yep. I had a hard time understanding that. It's true. But again, when we look at the reason for this whole scenario, God needed to see whether Jacob would really persevere, even as he needed to see whether Grandfather Abraham would really sacrifice son Isaac. Now he has to see, is Jacob really going to persevere? Is he really going to do this? He already, of course, knew the answer, but for our sakes, they went through it so that we would know one day that he did go through it. All right, let's finish up the chapter. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel. What does Peniel mean? Face of God. P-E-N-E-L. Face of God. Go ahead. Saying, it is because I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. Keep reading. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel. And he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. So he gets up in the morning limping badly. Goes on his way. But the whole point of this was, would Jacob hold on? If you read Thursday's lesson, it said Jacob went from wrestling to hanging on to Jesus. This was no longer a matter of who's going to win the wrestling match. It's a matter of can Jacob hang on? Can he persevere? Can he hang on? And he does. Well, we're about out of time, so we'll wrap this up quickly. In Genesis, in Matthew 26, we have the story of Jesus in Gethsemane. And when he prayed to his father, what did he ask his father to do for him? Take this cup away from me. But then he added, not my will, but yours be done. Was Jesus human? 100%. He was also 100% divine. But he was 100% human. As a human being, would he have rather not had to go through the cross? Of course. Which of us would ever say, yeah, I'd like to hang on a cross? I mean, no. We wouldn't want to go through that. Neither did he as a human being. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. All right, do we have any comments as we close today's lesson? I have a comment, and we have a microphone. Come, oh, go ahead, Rita. Uh, we have one here that says, uh, I don't think it's so much that God has to know, but we need to know through God. Okay, well done, well, well put, thank you. Sometimes we all go through things that are difficult as we are oh, yes. crucibles, but it's not just proving, some of it is proving to ourselves that we can, but also the very experience changes us. Yep. So the experience that Jacob had when he wrestled with Jesus transformed him. You will always know that even when he can't fight, he can hang on to God, and we can learn from that. And today, do we call his descendants the children of Jacob? Never. They're always the children of Israel, or even Israelites. 
Go ahead. When sin comes, you see it coming. You always have scripture memorized. I loose myself from the spirit of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I overcome the world by the power of the Holy Spirit. And once you've got these memorized, you can fight back against the, the enemy. So when, when you see those things, you just pray about it. Or you memorize scripture and keep it in your armory. And that helps a great deal. We still live in a world of sin. And there are still times when we will fall. And even though we don't want to, in Paul's experience, he said those are the things that he did. And, and we are the same way today. But thank the Lord we have a powerful God who can overcome these things for us. Okay, let's have a word of prayer to close our study. Father in heaven, today as we've studied this lesson, we've seen your great power and we've seen the foolishness of us as human beings. We mess up so many times. But thank the Lord you don't give up on us. You continue to work with us and through us. Please be with us now as we go into the next service, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
morning. Hey, good morning. We're going to open up with uh, Jesus is coming soon. Um, I haven't been here in what? Three weeks? Remember the last time I was here, I had to leave real quick. I had a uh, note to self. Don't use leftover Caesar salad dressing. Salmonella for a whole week. So. capo one but you're playing in C right okay here we go key of C want to try that again Times are here, filling men's hearts with fear. <laughs> oh, oh dear, now is at stake. Our two God saves from the chastening rod. Seek the way pilgrims trod. Christians awake. Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet the doom, trumpets will sound. All of the dead shall rise, righteous meet in the skies, going where no one dies, heavenward bound. Love us, so men, equal, losing their home of gold. This in God's word is told, evils abound. These signs come to pass, nearing the end at last. It will come very fast, trumpets will sound. Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet their doom, trumpets will sound. All of the dead shall rise, righteous meet the skies going where no one dies heavenward bound troubles will soon be your happy forevermore when we meet on that shore free from all care rising up in the sky telling this world goodbye homeward we then will fly Glory to share. Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet their doom, trumpets will sound. All of the dead shall rise, righteous meet in the skies, going where no one dies, heavenward bound. Praise the Lord. I like the end of that. Where no one dies. Think about it in heaven, huh? <laughs> Praise the Lord, huh? Yes. I appreciate all of you coming out today, and I just want to start with a few announcements. But first of all, I want to welcome you to this church. we got a nice group here today, and uh, we had a big group in the first service too. So praise the Lord that people are coming out to be with Him. I want to mention one thing before I begin. In front of you are prayer cards, and for those who aren't knowledgeable of this, they're meant to write down a prayer that's really on your heart. 
and then we pray for them, of course, up front here during the service, but then the elders and, and the pastor will work with them during the week too. Prayer is important, so fill out your cards. We'll pick them up just before the prayer time, okay? Um, loose offering today is for the church budget. And the way we do offering at this point is we have two trays in the back, one on each side. You put in your offering there. Uh, we stopped passing a plate during COVID and we just keep in doing it that way. Uh, eventually we're gonna build uh, some posts with slots in them, you can just put them in. It'll be more obvious than just a plate sitting in the back. But for now, that's what we do. I'll have a few dates to remember, they're up on the screen. One is uh, the prayer for the Holy Spirit, 7.30 a.m. tomorrow. You can get there online or you can join. Um, church picnic and voting day, that's 10.30 to 3 p.m. Fort Loudon. Uh, be there, it should be a lot of fun. For, if you don't even wanna go on a boat, we have some good food to eat and some nice fellowship. Uh, pastor's going to be on the vacation August 8th to 14th. That's this coming week. So the idea is you don't call him. Okay? Something comes up in your life, feel free to call the head elder, myself, one of the other elders. Get a hold of us and we'll help you. We will. So let's have the pastor have a little vacation. Uh, if we don't know how to solve something, we might call him. But uh, I hope not. Uh, Revelation Bible study. That's Tuesday. It says uh, the 23rd, 6.30 p.m. So keep that in mind, the Revelation seminar, or the Revelation Bible study. I think there's a lot of us out there who would like to study more deeply in Revelation. So this is a great opportunity. Um, you see the amazing disciples up here. Um, Keep that in mind. There's a bulletin insert in it. Please share this with others. Um, then there's one other announcement I have, and then the pastor has a couple. Um, Minister of the month. It's a new month, right? August. August important month. You know why it's important? My birthday's on the first day. Okay. So happy birthday to me. I get to say it to myself. Uh, so it's a great month. August is a great month. Uh, a little warm sometimes. But then we have a new minister of the month. And this month it is, where's my drum roll? Joanna Maliti. Joanna Maliti. Joanna? There you are. Now many of you may not have known this, but Joanna led up our vacation Bible school, and it was wonderful. I came out to help set it up, as well as many others, to take it down. My wife was telling me every day what happened, and it was beautiful. Yeah. And, I enjoyed it. And, and we enjoyed it, and we hadn't had one for years, and she stepped up and did it. So she is our minister of the month. Yeah, by the way, she gets the parking spot that says Minister of the Month. Okay? Pastor, it's yours. All right, we have a lot of special things going on today. First of all, I'm uh, looking for Rachel. And is Judy here today? I don't see Judy. Rachel coming up. Um, uh, uh, our school starts this coming week on Tuesday, right? And. Uh, you know, we are blessed to have a school here. And uh, it is a great school. We love our teachers. You know, they're very intent in not only teaching academics, but above all, teaching about Jesus Christ. And uh, we are thankful for that. You know, one of the, one of the blessings of Adventist education is statistically we know that the longer you are in Adventist education, the better you do across the board, okay? And so we are grateful that we can have a school here, and a school year is going to start. And um, I just we wanted to have uh, a, a special prayer. Um, <clears throat> uh, Bill, as an elder, if you want to come join me up here. Tulio, are you here too? We'd like to have a special prayer for um, Rachel and, of course, Judy as well. But Judy's not here today. Um, I forgot I had to talk to the microphone. Not for you. I'm loud enough. It's for people online that we want them to be able to hear. But 
let, let's pray. Our gracious and loving Father, Lord, remember when you called the church to set aside Paul and Barnabas to go and preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Um, and, and you had a laying on of hands. And so, Father, we want to follow that example. We lay our hands on Rachel. She is your missionary in our school. And we pray, Lord, that you empower with your spirit and Judy as well, Lord, even though she's not able to be with us here today. We pray that you will be with them both, that you would use them, Lord, for your honor and your glory and to teach our children. And we also pray, Lord, for a blessing on our school, on the children who will be coming and the parents. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> Another big thing that's happening uh, today, can anybody tell me what that is? Who knows? Baptism. Not one baptism, not two baptism, but five uh, baptisms. And so um, I am going to ask our baptismal candidates to come up. I'm kind of scanning where they are. Okay. Uh, Bobby and Darina uh, coming up. Uh, Jody Teaster. Bobby and Darina Tompkins. Uh, Jody Teaster, and then Diana is getting rebaptized along with her daughter Allie. Um, and uh, you know, the Lord works in many different avenues, right? Through, we learn lessons all throughout the place. And of course, the last thing we did was the Voice of Prophecy series, uh, Revelation, uh, Discovering Revelation. And uh, uh, it was, you know, during that meeting that some of these uh, you know, made a decision. Okay, this is it. I want to be baptized. You know, they've been studying all along. You know, I know, I know Diana, you know, shared with me, you know, I feel like a, after, you know, coming to the meeting, she says to me, I feel like a, um, I need to, you know, get rebaptized. And then, of course, Allie had chosen to be baptized. I thought, why don't we do this together? So mom and daughter will be getting baptized together. So it's a wonderful event. Okay. And uh, um, a, a couple of them have chosen to share a few words. Um, Bobby, go ahead. <laughs> so, um, there are a lot of people here today. <laughs> all, not that it's not a good thing, but of all days to have this many people. So, just bear with me. I want to do the best I can. Uh, this is kind of a sort of a testimonial, uh, but maybe it's just something else that I wanted to read, something that was from my heart. So, uh, my wife and I. Darina, who's behind me, uh, we have started a new journey, and that journey starting today, in the sense of giving ourselves over to, to Christ. Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verse 5 says, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Sorry. We ought to always honor those words and live the life Christ wanted us to live. It has been a long journey for both of us, uh, either through procrastination or drifting in and out of devotion, or just life and its obstacles and what it throws at us at times, distractions, all of which played a part in maybe uh, what Christ had in store for us all along. And we believe and we hope that he has, uh, the journey that he has put us on has led us where we are today. My father, um, who has since passed uh, for several years, uh, committed his life to Christ in the 1930s. During a big tent revival in Tampa, Florida, uh, the minister at that time was a gentleman by the name of J.L. Schuler, um, who was an, uh, once again was an Adventist evangelist speaker. Those types of events that my father attended, along with his family, were known as what they call old-time Seventh-day Adventist uh, tent efforts. All of his family were there at the time of the, uh, of the um, were at that time were devout Methodist. But after hearing the Adventist message with Mr. Schuler, they knew the truth of the Bible and that the Adventist faith would be the path that they would choose from that day forward. I wish my father were here today to not only see myself 
but his favorite daughter-in-law, as he would affectionately would call my wife, <laughs> being baptized. And I know one day I will hope to be able for us to tell him in person our journey and more importantly, all this efforts that he put forth in us uh, to be saved did not go in vain. Thank you to Pastor Ed and all those who have made us feel welcome at the Maryville Church. To Debbie and Dennis Malati, Malady, <laughs> and that's a great Irish name, by the way. By the way. So anyway, uh, thank you for your continued spiritual guidance, your generosity. time and friendship to Dorena and I, and to our former pastor in Apopka, Floyd Powell, and his beautiful and ever so sweet wife, Norma. I hope you are watching today from your home, and always know how much you touched our lives and how much we love you both. Thank you. Happy Sabbath. Boy, there's a lot of eyes on me, huh? Uh, Pastor Ed asked me if I wanted to do this. I didn't expect this. I thought it might be a fair in the sanctuary with minimal people. But, all right. Uh, as I was driving home, something come across my mind there. My memories fade on scripture, but I did come across this. Uh, Jesus said, uh, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith. And well, I'm glad I had the earwax out of my ear that day. Um, I was on the wrong train. <laughs> but uh, praise God, I'm here. Of course, we're in this temporary building, right? We need to get this building paid off so we can build our sanctuary. Um, but we don't have a baptistry in here, so the baptism will take place in the Bowen Chapel. Uh, concluding our service here so uh, as soon as the sermon's done I'll leave they'll head up there to get ready so those of you who want to watch it in person you're welcome to work your way after the service into the Bowen Chapel uh, we will also be showing it on the screen here and um, you know and those of you who are watching online uh, understand that we will have to stop the stream here and then restart a new stream from the sanctuary. So understand that if you want to watch the baptism online, you will have to um, uh, look for the new stream of the baptism. So, But uh, those of you who are members of the church, how many of you want to welcome them to the family, vote them in, uh, you know, subject of baptism here in just a few minutes? Amen. Amen. Any opposed? Good. If you did, I'll be in trouble with me. Anyways. <laughs> Anyways, let's, uh, let's continue with our worship service this morning. Our scriptural emphasis for today, it's on the front of your bulletins and we read it together. Um, so you can be on the same version, it's sometimes easier this way. So Galatians 5, 13, and 14, if you'd read that with me. For ye are called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Galatians 5, 13, and 14. Now it's yours. So I see a lot of old faces here. You guys are like a couple months early for the homecoming. So you know, if you want to leave now, you can just do that and come back. Place? They can stay, I guess. So. Spirit of the living God. I don't remember that one. Well, we're going to go on to the next one, regardless. I think we're supposed to be on. They'll know we are Christians by our love. There we go. We 
are one. The Spirit, we are one. We are one in the Spirit. We are one the Lord. And we pray that our unity may one day be restored. And they'll know the Christians by our love, by our love. And save each man's pride And they'll know we are Christians by our love By our love, yes, they'll know We are Christians by our Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah. Okay. Fairest Lord Jesus, Now and forever 
one verse of this and then we will kneel to pray and then we'll do another verse after we're done. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord, no tender voice like thine can and join me praying up front may do so kneel in your place bow your heads feel comfortable and if we're coming before the Lord asking to be with us our dearest heavenly father we bow our heads before you today not because we're shy, but because we're coming before your throne. We're coming before your throne, and we know how great and powerful and wonderful you are towards us. And we ask, Lord, that you'd send to us your Holy Spirit, that he'd be with us here in our service, in our time together, and throughout this Sabbath day, that your Holy Spirit might lead us, that your Holy Spirit might guide us, and that your Holy Spirit might truly comfort us. Lord, there are many that were not able to come today, some that are online watching. We ask that you'd bless them all in their homes, that you'd watch over them there, and that they'd feel your comforter. We ask, Lord, also that you'd be with those who are in trial across the world. There are many sad things happening these days, Lord, we especially ask that you be with those in Ukraine, the Ukrainian people. Bless them, O Lord, and help them in this time of trial. Also, Lord, we have Russian soldiers there, many of them not sure why. And I know, O Lord, that you can help them too. But most of all, we pray that this conflict would end. We ask, Lord, that you'd guide our congregation. Help us, Lord, to know how to reach out in our neighborhood, in our place here in Maryville. And we ask, Lord, that you'd help us, Lord, that we truly be an evangelistic church, a church that loves those around us and, and that can help those come amongst us. And Lord, some today are joining us through baptism. What a wonderful thing, O oh Lord. Five individuals stepping forward to follow you and we we, Lord, are so excited about that. And we ask that you would give a special outpouring of their grace, of your grace to them, that you would touch them in a special way today and throughout their journey until we all go through those heavenly gates. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you've blessed us, that COVID has subsided the way it has, that we can come together. And we know, Lord, that Satan would love to spread disease amongst us. And we ask that you protect us as the days go forward. Lord, we have a special prayer today we'd like to give for those individuals that we've been trying to touch through our evangelistic efforts and that we're going to try to reach out to as uh, the days go forward. Lord, there are many in this community that your Holy Spirit are working with. Help us, Lord, as individuals to choose a plan in which we can be part of that effort and, and touch others. Help us to see the opportunities that we have uh, in our daily walk that we might say something for you. Help us not to hesitate, Lord, but to have the words from on high that you give us. And finally, O oh Lord, we ask that you be with our pastor today who's going to bring us a sermon Help us, Lord, to open our hearts to it, 
Help us, Lord, that we would feel the touch of the Holy Spirit on our shoulders and that we'd be very attentive and learn of you. These things we pray, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, who gave all for us. Amen. Great. All right, it is now time for the children's story. So if the little ones would come up and grab a basket and collect money, Dakota Worthy student. boys and girls are you having a good Sabbath me too I love Sabbath Sabbaths are my favorite all right I need a volunteer please raise your hand if you're a brave little soul all right come on up here's a dollar wait stay here stay here that's for you I did not take it from the baskets that's from you stay here Here's my question. Do you want to keep that dollar or do you want to sacrifice it for what's in this envelope? Now, if you want the envelope, you have to give me the dollar. Do you want the envelope? I'll take your dollar. Ready to see what's inside? Good sacrifice. Go sit back down, please. <laughs> I need a volunteer if you're brave enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
here's a dollar. Now that's your dollar, you can have it, or you can sacrifice it for what's in envelope number two. You want to sacrifice it? She has a handful of washers, so you might want to give those back to Papa because he can find those useful later. <laughs> I need a volunteer if you're brave enough. Right. This dollar is yours. Now you're a little bit different. I'm actually going to show you, if you were to give me that dollar, what you would get, okay? I'm going to show you what that is. Would you like to make a sacrifice for this? I mean, it's pretty, kind of. No? You may go back and keep your dollar. You know, we make sacrifices, don't we, every day? Sometimes we make sacrifices where we get something even better. Sometimes we make sacrifices where we get something that's maybe okay, but not great. But you know what's amazing is Jesus made the greatest sacrifice of all when he left perfect, beautiful heaven to come to our broken world where he was going to be rejected. And he still died for us. Lydia and Verity are going to share a short poem about what Jesus did. One day Jesus came to town and people threw their garments down. They all began to shout and cheer, Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus is here. Oh. But when the leaders in the town hear the cheers, it made them frown. They did not like to see this man and so they made a wicked plan. <laughs> they came to get him late at night with all their torches burning bright. The leaders took him to a place where soldiers laughed and hit his face. And when the sun had risen high, they put him on a cross to die. They did not know that he was God's son and that he died for everyone. Jesus' friends all wondered why the Son of God would have to die. They came and took his body down and sadly laid it in the ground. They sealed the tomb and walked away. There's never been a sadder day. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the gift of your Son. Please help us to fully surrender our hearts so that we can live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may go back to your seats. Thank you. So this song uh, was written by Rachel's brother, and he writes a, a lot of really interesting songs, and so we just wanted to, the girls wanted to share it, it's one of their favorites, so. What I have done, don't 
to pardon and sanctify me. I can keep to myself this wonderful love that you shared at the cross when you gave your life to show to the world the Father is good. How could a father forgive my sin when I pushed him away? With open arms, take me back again and give me a merited grace. I can't keep to myself this wonderful love that you shared at the cross when you gave your life to show to the world Father is good. How could a father give up his son to die for someone like me? To come pay the price for what I have done, to pardon and sanctify me. I can't keep to myself this wonderful love that you shared at the cross. When you gave your life to show to the world, Father is good. Father is good. Father, you're Testing, one, two, three, am I coming through? You know, even in this world of sin, pain, and suffering, God's glory still shines through. I don't know about you, but I've been blessed already this morning. Thank you for all those who led in worship, children's story, Clifford's for sharing that beautiful song uh, uh, with us. Um, and uh, <clears throat> kids, do you have your uh, kids' sermon notes? Have them ready. If you don't, raise your hands. Um, the deacons are also be passing out a little handout for the sermon, but I just want to uh, share um, some of the pictures that were drawn uh, last week. Okay, and we have kids that are creative, you know, you know, if I see the three testimonies from last time, okay, uh, we got a picture of Jesus, isn't that beautiful? Um, <clears throat> and um, all kinds of uh, wonderful, creative things. Um, one, one over here even put the time. <laughs> Did everybody share their testimony? I'm going to tell you, kids are creative. Um, you know, and sharing their, their pictures, you know, preaching from the pulpit, speaking, um, sharing. There is Michelle playing the harp, okay? And uh, that cute little frog. Um, so, um, uh, anyway, so I appreciate the kids. Again, uh, uh, keep your drawing. The keyword today is remnant. Keyword today is remnant. <clears throat> um, I'm going to ask you to open up your Bibles to Revelation chapter 12. We're going to be hitting this uh, really fast and, and furious um, because there's a certain point that I want to get to, and there's a lot of information in here, and I understand that for some of you, you may get a little lost. I invite you to ask me about it at some time um, <clears throat> because I'm covering a lot of material in a short period of time. And the reason why I gave you that handout is because I'll have some explanations that I want to. Um, 
So anyway, so if you got your Bibles open to Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 12, we will get started there. Revelation chapter 12. And I'm working my way there myself. All right. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head, and its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. So here we have, at the heart of the book of Revelation, a very critical message that God has put in here. Now, again, we don't have time to go into, but one of the, one of the aspects of Old Testament writing, and we're seeing here, here in this New Testament book, is called the chiastic structure. And just to make a quick point, chapters 12, 13, and 14 are at the center of the climax of this chiastic structure. In other words, God put the message in the Revelation, this central core message. It's an important message that God has put in there. <clears throat> and um, there we go, okay? Now, what happens often in the book of Revelation is that we've got a lot of symbolisms, and God gives a symbol, and then he seeks to give you a description to identify who that is. We do this all the time, right? You're talking about somebody, but the person doesn't know their name, right? We'll do this in church. Oh, yeah, so-and-so. Who is that? And what do we do? We describe them, right? Tall, short, white hair, black hair, red hair, you know, whatever. We give some descriptions or they're the ones who do the special music, you know, uh, whatever it is. Or we give a description to help identify who it is. The book of Revelation does that consistently, right? And so in, the, in this, what we've read so far, there are three characters. There's a woman who represents God's people. If you look at your notes, it gives you some text to demonstrate that. The dragon, as we'll see a little bit later, is the devil. And then we have one more character, and that is Jesus, who is a child. It's the event being described here, Okay where you have the birth, okay, <clears throat> and the um, ascension of Jesus Christ, right? So the devil goes to kill Jesus when he is born, right? And then what do we have after his ministry? He ascends to heaven, and where does he go to? His throne. <clears throat> and then what happens next? The woman, God's people, goes into the wilderness for how long? 1,260 days, right? That's what we read in Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 and 6. What we have here is a historical point in time. Revelation is telling us what took place. We know in the line of history where this event takes place, right? And then what proceeds afterwards, the birth of Jesus, the ascension of Jesus, and then Sometime after that, the woman goes into the wilderness for 1,260 days, all right? So now, those are the events that took place on earth, all right? So we know where we are in the timeline of history, okay? Now let's go to verse 7, and the event location of the scene changes. Revelation chapter, seven, verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 7, sorry. Then war broke out in heaven. So where are we now? 
heaven, right? So the other scene took place on earth. Now we kind of had like a little interlude or a change of scene, and the focus goes to heaven. War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough. What do you say to that? Amen, Amen right? And they lost their place in heaven. So what does it tell us that they had a place in heaven, and now they've lost their place in heaven, okay? The dragon was hurled down, and again, this is another thing that God does. You know, a lot of people are worried about the book of Revelation. They don't, actually, there's a lot of Christians who don't want to touch the book of Revelation because they find it too confusing, too challenging. But the truth is that the major messages of the book of Revelation are clear. God gives us clues in the passage to be able to understand this very significant information that God gave, the very last revelation of God in the Bible. And here is an example where God makes it clear. Because what does he say? <clears throat> the great dragon was hurled down, that what? That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan. Do you know that there are many Christian churches that say, well, we don't know who the serpent was. Here it tells us clearly the serpent is the devil. No question clearly identified, right? <clears throat> so the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray, he was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. So we have a scene on earth, a scene in heaven, okay? And then the next section of chapter 12 is a praise and a warning, right? And so let's go ahead and read that praise and that warning, Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice from heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. Again, now when Jesus was on earth, after the ascension, what did he tell his disciples when he did the Great Commission? He said, all authority has been given to me, right? Same consistent ideas here. For the accuser of our brethren and sisters who are, accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down, right? So it's a celebration of God's victory, okay? They triumphed over him. Now, talking about those who believe, right? The saints. They triumphed over him by three things. What are the three things? Number one. Who can see it there in the text? By the blood of the Lamb, right? We're in verse 11. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb. What's the second thing? By the word of their testimony. And the third one's a little long one, but basically what does it mean? They are willing to die for Jesus. Let me put that even shorter. They were all in for Jesus. You know, at the beginning of last month, I was um, inspired by the Lord to preach a sermon that we need to be all in for Christ, right? We handed out this card, I encourage you to put that on there to be praying and say, Lord, I want to be all in for you. I want to be all in for you. I don't want to be like that rich young ruler who walked away. I want to be willing that if you were to ask me to surrender everything, that I would count it worthy. And I hope that you've been praying that prayer, right? Because they overcame him how? By the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and that was demonstrated how? That they were willing to die for Jesus. They were all in for him. Okay? All right, so let's keep reading. Uh, <clears throat> And so they overcame him by the, uh, the blood of the Lamb and the word of the testimony, and then they did not love so much as a shrink from death. Verse 12, Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to the earth and the sea, because a devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. So in a one step we have praise. God won. But the devil has been hurled to the earth. He is out to destroy people. 
That's the reality. The book of Revelation is trying to tell us that we're in the midst of the war. We would not know this except for the revelation that God gives us. From our perspective, it looks like Republicans against Democrats, communists and socialists against this and that, and we can see all kinds of crazy things. But what we know that behind all of that, there's a bigger struggle, and that is between the forces of evil and the devil and God. And the only way we know that is through the revelation that God gives us in the book of Revelation, of course, all of it. <clears throat> All right. So now the scene, uh, the chapter continues with verse 13. Okay. <clears throat> Let's go to there, verse 13. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child, right? So the scene moves back to earth, right? Because the devil's been kicked out. So we're back to the earth again, and we pick up the story where we left off. 14, the woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to a place prepared for her in the wilderness where she would be taken care of for a time times and half a time out of the serpent's reach. So what we see here, the first picture of the scenes on earth ended with what? The woman in the wilderness. Then we have a pause and the scene goes to heaven and sees this war that takes place and the devil is kicked out to the earth. The scene now moves back to the earth and picks up where we left off. And again, this is another way that God helps us understand what he's writing. Why? In the first chapter, in the first verse there, 6, it says that the woman went in there for how long? In verse 6, the woman was in the wilderness for how long? 1,260 days, right? Now we come to verse 14, same event. The woman is in the wilderness, but instead of saying 1,260 days, what does it say? It says time, times, and a half of times. In other words, it's God's way in the text to let us know that we are understanding time, times, and a half of times correctly. That it means 1,260 days, which means three and a half years. Because in the Jewish calendar, a year was 360 days. 360, 360, 360, and half, 180. You add it all together, and it comes out to 1,260 days. God wants us to understand this. He put this at the center of the book of Revelation because it's critical for us to understand. So again, <clears throat> Same event, right there. The woman is in the wilderness. You have the time, times, and a half of times, which is the same thing as the 1,260 days. And of course, when you apply the day-to-year principle, there are many Christians and other denominations who understand the day-to-year principle and prophecy. And now, they may apply it strictly to the, the, the one week that they talk about. That will be a period of seven years, Okay. So they understand the principle of the day-year principle, okay? And so what would that be? That 1,260 days would be 1,260 years. Now, again, keep in mind a sequence of events. Birth, ascension of Jesus. After that, the woman goes into the wilderness for 1,000 260 years. Understand the time frame that chapter 12 is telling us that God put in there. Right? <clears throat> now, another line of evidence, and we don't have time to go into Daniel chapter 7, but another line of evidence is when you compare this to Daniel chapter 7. That expression, time, times, and a half a times, and how many books of the Bible is it found? Anybody want to guess? It's found in only two books, Revelation and Daniel. Only in the book of Revelation and Daniel. And it's found in Daniel chapter 7 and then again in Daniel chapter 12. And they're talking about the same event. It is God's way of saying, listen, I'm taking the information from over there. It applies here. 
when we look at Daniel chapter 7 and we look what's happening with the, with the little horn and what it does, it's parallel to what happens to the woman in 1,260 years. Okay? God wants us to understand this. And so real quickly, because we don't have time to go to Daniel chapter 7, I put a little rough timeline that Daniel chapter 7 gives us. It starts off with Babylon being the lion, Medo-Persia being the bear, Greece being the leopard, Rome being the Roman Empire, right, which is when Christ was born, right? And then you have the fall of the pagan Roman Empire and the establishment of the Holy Roman Empire. And again, this is all the outline that's found in the book of Daniel. And then after that, you have judgment, and then after that, you have the coming of Christ. And if you want some homework, go back, read Daniel chapter 7. You will see this outline clearly portrayed. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 7, that time, times and a half of times that Revelation talks about, that's the same time period, falls in the same place in Daniel chapter 7. It is not a coincidence. God has revealed it. Remember, when he revealed this, it was all the way back in the time of Babylon. God has accurately predicted the course of history almost 3,000 years ago. And there are many out there who want to destroy the, the book of Daniel because it predicts the future so accurately that they can't have it. And so they say, oh, it was written later. They come up with all kinds of excuses. But it's more archaeology and more research is done. We find out that Daniel was right. It shows that this book is a divine book. No human being could have accurately predicted the course of human history the way the Bible has done it. And so again, I want you to keep in mind what happened. So what do we know? That message that we're going to see you talk about in just a minute where it takes place. So we'll come back to that in just a second. So... We have that parallel to Daniel 7, Daniel 7, same time period, right? We're talking about the same events. And it takes place after pagan Roman Empire, right? So we know the outline of history. So now let's go to verse 7, verse 17. Then a dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring. Now, there's something strange about that sentence. He is enraged with the woman, but who does he go after? Her, the rest of her offspring, the remnant, depending on which version you have, right? Why does he go after the rest of her offspring? What happened to the woman? Why is he not looking at the woman and going after the rest of the offspring? If you want the answer to that, come to the Revelation class. That will start uh, uh, on uh, Tuesday, August 23. We won't cover that today. But the focus changes. We have the introduction of a new character, and the new character is the offspring of the woman. Okay? This new character is what in the Old Testament is referred to as a remnant. Just like when Israel was taken captive and only a small group came out, right? They were the, they're the ones who chose to stick to God's message. All right. <clears throat> so who are this remnant? Who are they? Okay. Again, what did I tell you? In the book of Revelation, whenever a character is introduced, what do we do? We have a way to identify. There's a description given. What's the description given of these? And it says in Revelation 17, right? Rest of the offspring who keep the commandments of God and hold fast to the testimony about Jesus. And of course, there's the NIV. It says about Jesus. I'll come to that in a second. So the first thing it says, keep the commandments. Now, the idea here is not just to observe the commandments. It is to hold on to the commandments, to still believe them, to be loyal to the commandments of Jesus. And what's amazing is the majority of the world has chosen not to be loyal to all the commandments. They're loyal to some, but not all. That's the reason why we come to church on Sabbath, because we want to honor Jesus and honor the laws he gives us. And he tells us, remember the seventh day to keep it holy. 
And so we want to honor all the commandments, not just the ones that we want. And then what's the other characteristic? They hold to the testimony of Jesus. And let me give you a little quick clarification here. That's why some version says testimony about Jesus. Some say testimony of Jesus. In the Greek, it's not clear. In the Greek, you can translate it in ways, right? It is a testimony about Jesus or a testimony, in essence, from Jesus. Which one is it? What's interesting in the NIV, this phrase in the Greek shows up four times. The only place in the Bible where it shows up, only in the book of Revelation, shows up four times. Every time the NIV translates it as a testimony of Jesus, except here in Revelation 12, 17. You look at your other versions, it will say the testimony of Jesus. Not, and I'm sorry, the NIV translates the testimony about Jesus. Sorry. <clears throat> Let me clarify that. Every else, testimony of Jesus. Anyway, so which one is it? How do we understand this, right? I mean, this is critical to identify who are this remnant, these last day people who the dragon is going after. Well, we need to understand what the testimony of Jesus is. What do we do? We see how it's used in the book of Revelation, the context to tell us. So let's do that. Let's go to Revelation chapter 1. So come over to Revelation chapter 1. <clears throat> How many times did I say the testimony of Jesus is used in Greek in the, in the Bible? Four times. And all four of them are where? In the book of Revelation. Here's the first one. We'll start with verse, verse 1 to get context. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Notice what's happening here, right? So you have this message that God gives Jesus. You kind of have like this chain of revelation, right? So you have the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gives to Jesus. Follow me, keep following me. <clears throat> and it's about the things that will surely take place. And it says, and he sent it and signified it by what? His angel, right? So God gives it to Jesus. Jesus gives it to the angel. And then what happens? By his angel to who? To John. So... Jesus, God gives it to Jesus. Jesus gives it to the angel who is supposed to give it to John. So the message is for John through the angel, right? Okay, let's keep reading. Who, who's who? It's John, right? John bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus. Let me ask you a question. Did you hear or did you see what John saw? No. Who is the one who heard and saw what John saw? John, right? Okay. John bore to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus. And if it's not even clear, let's keep going, right? Who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus to all things that he saw. We don't see it. We just read what John heard and saw. Okay? Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy. Now that's you and me. So in this verse, the testimony of Jesus is clearly John's ability or calling for God to speak to him. He writes it down so we can have it and read it today, right? So, first occurrence tells us what? The testimony of Jesus is the ability John had to hear the message from God. We don't have that. John did, right? The next occurrence is in um, verse 9. It, it's not clear there. In other words, it doesn't add any more information. The next one is Revelation 19.10. So let's go to Revelation chapter 19, verse 10. Revelation chapter 19, verse 10. Picture what's happening here, right? So Revelation 19, 10. And I tell, and I fell at his feet to worship him, right? So who's giving the information to John? 
the angel, right? Who got it from Jesus, who got it from God, right? So the, the angel is sitting there walking John through this. And so John is so impressed with all of this that he falls down to worship who? The angel, right? So keep that picture in mind. See to it that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have what? The testimony of Jesus, right? So there is that phrase again. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is what? The spirit of prophecy. God spells it out clearly. Clearly. Chapter 1, it is what John sees in here. Chapter 15, if you didn't catch it from there, he tells you clearly this the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And guess what? God says, listen, in case you don't get it, I'm going to do another way of demonstrating it. It's the same way he did in earlier, right? When he paralleled two situations, but used two different terms, right? In Revelation chapter 12, verse 6, he said 1,260 days. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, he said time, times, and a half at times. Same story, different terms to what? Tell us they mean the same thing. Guess what? God does the same thing again when we compare Revelation 22, 8, and 9 and Revelation 19, 10. And to make it simple, I've put it up here. And if you notice, what does God do? The situation is identical. But notice what's substituted for hold to the testimony of Jesus. What's substituted? Prophets. So the testimony of Jesus is the prophetic gift. It is not something that your average believer has. We have the words of this prophecy. But to be able to hear the testimony of Jesus is a special prophetic gift that John possessed. That he is saying that this group of people who are to proclaim the message in the last days possess. Now, we believe that God has called us to proclaim this last day message. And we believe that that fulfillment of that spiritual gift was demonstrated in the ministry of Ellen White. <clears throat> and, and again, if you think of the timeline, right? If you think of the timeline... When does that remnant, when does that offspring takes place? After the, the 1260 days, a time, times, and a half of times, which ended when? 1798, when Berthier, the general under Napoleon, marched into the Vatican and took the Pope captive. It started when the three of the kingdoms fell. And again, you have to go back to Daniel chapter 7. But that period of 1260 days ended in 1798. Sometime after that is when you have the rest of our offspring expression who keep the commandments and have the prophetic gift. And again, I tell you, I believe that God has called this church to proclaim that last day message. I believe that's what, that when God wrote this, why would he put that information in there if it wasn't important? Why did he set that timeline? Why did he give those identifying marks? And when we look at history, how many organizations are proclaiming all of the commandments, even including the seventh? Fit in the right timeline and, bear the, and hold on to the testimony of Jesus. So, <clears throat> what is this remnant supposed to do? And again, we don't have time to go all to it. And, and the, uh, Revelation 12 13 and 14 are the great climax, the heart of the book of Revelation. 12 sets the scene, the background of this war that was in heaven that is being fought here on earth. 13 tells you how the devil is fighting on his side. That's the beast. That's where you get the mark of the beast. That's where you, get, you can't buy and sell and all those things come in Revelation chapter 13 because that is how the devil is working. But then we come to chapter 14 and it goes back to God's people. 
and describing what they do and what they are like, and then they talk about this three angels message. See, the remnant are to proclaim a last day message before Christ comes. And again, today we're not going to cover the details of that message. But I just want to summarize it very quickly. One, this last day people are to preach that we need to go back to the Bible. We need to go back to the teachings of the Bible. We need to keep all the commands of Jesus. Okay. So we want to go back <clears throat> to follow the Lamb wherever He goes, right? So we honor Jesus and His truth. Not what I like, not what I want, not what tradition says, not what other people speak. What God has given us in this Bible to go back to be faithful to that because we love Jesus. And finally, to leave on biblical teachings, right? It's worded in the sense of, come out of her, my people. Come out of false teaching, false ideas. Come back to the genuine teachings of the Bible. Honor Jesus by following him wherever he goes. Not tradition, not what is always believed, but what Jesus teaches in the Bible. Now, what does that mean? I know it sounds awkward to sit there and say, oh yeah, wow, we've got the remnant message. Well, let me, let me pause for a second and tell you, let me tell you what I think this means. One, first of all, by telling you what it, not, it does not mean, okay? One, it does not mean that we're better than any other Christians. All right. You know, um, Jesus speaking to the Jews who were God's called people to hold on to truth, right? And who the Messiah would come through. Right? They were called for a special mission okay, to hold the truth and through that lineage for Jesus to be born. Right? But it's to them, he says, I have sheep who are not of this fold. Right? And it's not for us to make the determination. We're not better than any other Christians. We just have a special message that needs to be preached in these last days because time is running out. What else does it not mean? That we're not saved by the message. We're saved by Jesus Christ. Just because we bear a special message doesn't mean we're saved. We're only saved by the work of Jesus Christ. The Jews confused that. They got so hung up on who they were that they thought they were special that they treated and looked down upon others. That's not our calling. What else does that mean? It's not mean arrogance. We're not arrogant. We're not better. We're not superior. Okay? What it does mean is that God has revealed to you and me a message. And when God spoke to John 2,000 years ago and he looked forward to the future, he saw the people who will listen to the voice of God. Flow, going against what was popular, to be faithful to the message of Jesus Christ. And that we are honored and privileged to hold to that message. We're not any more special, we're not any better. But we're privileged to be able to know that message. But what does that also mean? that we have the privilege to share that message. And therefore, we should be committed to share that message. You know, I said um, to pray to be all in for Jesus. I'll tell you this, when we are all in for Jesus, Jesus is going to give us a calling. Jesus is going to give us a work for us to do. Jesus is calling us to do something for him to proclaim this last day message. If we are all in for Jesus, he is calling us to do something. All I'm asking you is to pray. If God has not revealed something to you, keep praying. He will. He has called you to do something special for him. 
What is the dream? What's the vision? What's the, the, the ministry that God is placing in your heart? It's time to listen to that and move forward. Whatever it is, whether it be directly preaching the message or whether it be through the ministry of the church, right? There are lots of needs in our church, but maybe God is calling you to do something outside this church. That God is calling you to witness to people at work. That God is calling you to share with things to people wherever you interact with them. That God is calling you to give Bible studies, right? In your bulletins, there's a, a, a way to be trained in how to give Bible studies. If you're wanting and you feel God calling you to do that, I encourage you to take advantage of that. So, of course, you take at home, right? Online at your time. And so in the bulletin is the information. Whatever God is calling you, pursue it. Pursue it. Because we are privileged to have this message. But that also commits us to share that message. So as we close, I ask you to get the connection cards out. And once again, those of you watching online, well, once we finish our closing song, we'll end the stream here. And then in a few minutes, we'll start to stream in the sanctuary for the baptism. But for those of you who are here, just two questions. If you don't feel the Lord has impressed you with a mission, then pray, Lord, what are you calling me to do? You have gifted me. Gifted me with a message, gifted me with abilities. What are you calling me to do? Pray and God will reveal it to you. If you feel the Lord has given you something, but you're not sure, or you haven't pursued it, I ask you that, okay, what do I have to do to start pursuing it? And if you're going to make that choice today, put a check in box two. And so I hope that as we sing this closing prayer, that it will be your prayer, that it will be your commitment, okay? <clears throat> that when Jesus calls, I will go where you want me to go. I will say what you want me to say. I invite you to stand with us as we sing our closing hymn, I will go where you want me to go.
together. Baptism is going to be in the Bowdoin Chapel, right? So you can also going to be displayed on the screen. And chairs at this point, we'll do that after the baptism, okay? Those who wish to come up with the uh, their notes, that's now's the time. 